Our message for today I'm very excited about is from the Gospel of John. Please take your Bibles and join me. As you turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 4, we're going to be studying the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. And this will be part one. There are about 42 verses in this story, and we're probably going to get through about 14 of them today. And I'll read verses 1 through 14. Then we're going to back up, and this is going to sort of be an expository sermon where we're going to go verse by verse through this passage and find out what's happening here. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard, I'm sorry, therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, being John the Baptist, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, he sat thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for the disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you've got nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give will never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, there's our passage that we're going to be taking a look at. This is uh, one of the beautiful stories in the Bible that helps us to understand the gospel. John chapter 4, the woman at the well. Let's reread the first few verses again. John 4, verse 1. When the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples. Now, did Jesus believe in baptism? He certainly did. First thing, he's baptized. Last thing he says, go teach and baptize. First thing in Acts, repent and baptize. Making a commitment to Christ is very important to the Lord. And so this was part of it. But, and it says, though Jesus personally did not baptize, but his disciples baptized. And when he knew that the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing more than John. Now, in your Bibles, I want you to go to John chapter 3. We're just going to look at this real quick so you see. John chapter 3, it's not very far. Verse 22, let's read this. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained. This after his time in Jerusalem with Nicodemus. They go down probably towards the Jordan a little bit. There, there's water and some of the tributaries to the Jordan. And there he remained with them, and he baptized. Now, John was also baptized in Anon near Salem. John is on the Jordan River a little further north than where they are in Judea because there was much water there. And they came and they were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown in prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about, about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan, speaking of Jesus, to whom you gave testimony, saying he was the Lamb of God, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John, it's not fair. Everyone's leaving our denomination, and they're going to their denomination. They're leaving our group, and they're going to his group. Now, you know what John said. He said, this is God's plan. My, I was supposed to introduce and announce Jesus. John the Baptist said, he must increase. I must decrease. My whole job was to transition people, to channel people to Christ. And he said, don't be jealous that they're following Jesus. That's why I pointed him out. So now Jesus' group is growing. Now, why does Jesus leave town? Because the Pharisees who were already jealous about John the Baptist having so many followers. They didn't like John the Baptist. John the Baptist, he said, you need to be baptized to the religious leaders. They said, us? He said, yeah, you're a brood of vipers. 
You, unless you repent and you're baptized, you'll be lost. And they were indignant about that. Well, Jesus, is a, he's cut from the same cloth as John the Baptist in his preaching. John the Baptist said, repent and be baptized. Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so, similar message. But now Jesus is getting so much more attention that it's getting the ire of the Pharisees. And Jesus said, you know, we probably ought to start working in a different area right now because I better head back up to Galilee where we're going to have less opposition. It says, he left Judea and he departed again to Galilee. Now Christ told his disciples when he sent them out preaching, Matthew 10, verse 23, when they persecute you in this city, arm yourself to the teeth for a battle. No, he said, flee to the other. Jesus said, if they persecute you in one place, if you're not making headway, go somewhere else, keep on preaching. He followed his own advice. He said, look, I'm not trying to stir things up prematurely. I know how my story is going to end. It's not time for that yet, so I'm heading up to Galilee. And then it goes on and it tells us uh, he went up to Samaria. Who were the Samaritans? We're going to take some time because they come up a lot in the whole gospel this is a great place to explain that. So you read here in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 24, And Amri bought the hill of Samaria from Shemer for two talents of silver. And he built on the hill, and he called the name of the city which he built Samaria after the name of Shemer. So there was some guy named Shemer who lived a long time ago, and all the Samaritans' name is drawn from him. And so that's where you get the name Samaria, I know it's a little corruption of the original name Shemer, but uh, he owned this property. He sold it, became the new capital for the northern kingdom that was always at war with the southern kingdom. But because of the idolatry in the northern kingdom, they were the first ones to be judged by God. And in 721 BC, the Assyrians came down. They fought against the northern kingdom, and the king of Assyria took the ten tribes captive. Those ten tribes did not reassemble. Now, this is so important to understand. The, um, the tribe of Judah, Benjamin and Levi, when they were taken to Babylon, they ended up coming back again. They remained a unique, distinct people. But what happened when the ten tribes went to Assyria, they had already lived years on the border of Assyria, they began to intermarry with the Assyrians and you're not going to find any people who are really distinct, pure blood members of the tribe of Issachar or Ephraim or Zebulun or Naphtali or Dan or any of the others. The reason we use the word Jew is because they're from the tribe of Judah. They did remain a lot more distinct. Um, what happened is they sort of intermarried with the uh, Assyrians. So these ten tribes are carried to the north and um, then the king, well, let me read it to you here. In the ninth year of Hoshea, this is 2 Kings 17, 6. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away to Assyria. And he placed them in um, Hala and by Habor, the river Gozam, in the city of the Medes. Then the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kuleth, Ava, Hamath, and from Sepharavim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they took possession and they dwelt in the cities. But the problem was they weren't completely, uh, they, they weren't completely believing in the God of Judah. They were still worshiping idols. Lions began to attack them. And all these lions began to attack them. They said, what is it? And they said, we must not know the God of the land. So the king of Assyria sent some priests that were left from the tribes down. He said, you better teach them about the God of the land so the lions will stop attacking them. So they came to where they believed the five books of Moses. They practiced circumcision, but then they were still involved in a different kind of corrupt worship. So you read here in 2 Kings 17, 33, they feared the Lord, yet they served their own gods according to the rituals of the nations among whom they were carried away. So the Jews viewed the Samaritans as sort of mongrels. They were, they were keeping some of their religion, but they were really Assyrian. They are a Semitic people. You know where the word Semitic, when, when someone says you're anti-Semitic, people often think that means you're anti-Jewish. But if you don't like Arabs, you're anti-Semitic. The Semitics are people who came from Shem. A Shemite is a Semitic. 
And so it's not just Jews, it's actually any Semitic person who's from uh, you know, the Arabic uh, uh, range there. So they, they didn't like them at all. But what really was the deal breaker? You know there was a lot of antipathy between the Jews and the Samaritans. You know what it really did? It. You read in the book of Ezra chapter 4, when they were starting to rebuild the temple, they came, the Samaritans, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's house and they said to them, let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do. They said, let's compromise. I know we don't worship exactly the same, but we worship Jehovah. Let us help you build the temple. And we've sacrificed to him since the days of Esher Haddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. They admit, we're imports, but we also are worshiping your God. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the fathers in the houses of Israel said to them, you may do nothing with us to build a house for our God, but we alone will build to the Lord our God as the King Cyrus, king of Persia, has commanded us. So they were spurned. The high priest realized that if we allow the Samaritans to help us build, they're going to bring their corruption of worship in, and we're going to be back where we were before we got carried off to Babylon. They said, no, we cannot let you because you guys do not believe all of the scriptures. You only believe the five books of Moses. And you're also involved in idolatry. And they had a number. Of, so there was a war that broke out, a spiritual civil war, if you will, between the Samaritans. And it goes on to say, then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in building. You've read the book of Nehemiah. They kept trying to stop them from building. So instead of them saying, let's join together, now they became enemies. That war went on all through the time of Christ. That's why Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. Because, uh, and the, the leper, 10 lepers are healed, but the one who comes back to say thank you is a Samaritan. And so he often accentuates that God still loves Samaritans even though they don't understand everything. Where was this meeting? Now, I already alluded to it. It says, John 4, verse 6, now Jacob's well was there. It tells us it's in Sychar. A matter of fact, you can see a map that's on the screen. Now Sychar was in the middle of the promised land. And in the middle of the promised land, Jacob had lived for many years in a place called Shechem. Some of you remember the story in the Bible where Dana, Dinah rather, had, had uh, a, a brief affair with the prince of Shechem. And it ended up becoming a battle. And, that's where Jacob was living during that time. And during the many years that Jacob lived in Shechem, Sychar is right there in the same area, he dug a well for all the flocks and the herds. The wells were often not in the town because from these wells they would often water the flocks and you don't want to live where there's too many flocks. You got a lot of flies and it's not always pleasant. So they had this well outside the town, but it, it was a dry country, but a deep well and a very good well. And that well is still there today. In fact, I think we've got a picture of that on the screen. There it is. It's all, of course, everything in, in Israel now. They got a church on top of everything. And so I don't know which denomination, it may be some Orthodox church has this, but there is Jacob's well, and it dates back to the time of Jacob, and it is still producing good water, and it is a very deep well, hand-dug well. And so this is a real story about a real place. That place, Sychar, is in the middle of the Promised Land. It is between two mountains. You had Mount a Gerizim, Mount Ebal. And when the children of Israel came into the Promised Land, they were told that they were supposed to pronounce the blessings and the cursings from these two mountains. They divided the tribes, 50%, six tribes went on one side, and six of the 12 went on the other side, with a valley between. You know what was in the valley? Jacob's well. When the children of Israel came back into the Promised Land, half of them, a lot, a lot of people, stood on one mountain, Half of them stood on the other mountain. They reread under the instruction of Joshua the blessings and the cursings. In fact, you can read about this, Deuteronomy 11:29. Now it shall be when the Lord your God has brought you into the land that you go to possess, you will put the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. Blessings if you obey. And like there, one of them would say, cursed is he that makes the blind to go out of the way. And all the people would say, amen. So they, were, they had this whole narration that Moses had given them. You read in Joshua 8.33, they finally did it. Then all of Israel, with their elders and officers and judges, stood on either side of the ark before the priests, the Levites who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord, the stranger as well as he who was born among them, half of them in front of Mount Gerizim, 
half of them in front of Mount Ebal, as Moses the servant of the Lord had commanded that they should bless the people. The bullseye right in the middle of this whole thing was Jacob's well. So it's very significant that Jesus has this instruction about living water at the place where the covenant was ratified in the middle of the promised land. And it's in the city of Sychar. The word Sychar it means drunken. And the word Shechem, this is the other city, it means shoulder. There may have been a hill that was shoulder shaped up there. And then don't forget this, it's in the middle of the promised land where the blessing and the cursing was. And it says it's the well on the plot of land that Jacob gave Joseph. Something else is, uh, this is a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Yes, Jesus preached to great crowds, but Christ had a heart for individuals as well. You can think of a few other one-on-one -on -one meetings. Of course, you go to John chapter 3, he's meeting one-on-one -on -one with Nicodemus. And you might be thinking, how do we know what he said to Nicodemus if it was a one-on-one -on -one meeting? Well, Nicodemus became a believer and he probably rehearsed the whole conversation. How do we know what Jesus said to this woman? Well, she later became a believer and she probably shared with the disciples, this is what the conversation was. And so they were able to accurately record these things. But it's not only that, he has a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Martha just before the resurrection of Lazarus, with Mary Magdalene at the tomb, with a demoniac by the sea. But the longest one-on-one -on -one conversation in the Bible is Jesus with the woman. Now, I could be wrong, but it's, uh, I think it's up there in the top. And so this is a very important passage for us to consider. I'm glad that Jesus, in that one-on-one -on -one relationship, it tells us what he wants with each of us. The time that he took to personally commune with her and answer her questions and probe what her greatest needs were, he feels that way about every one of us. The Lord wants to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with you. He cares for each of us. He loves each one of us. Something else we notice about this story, you look in John 4, verse 7. Jesus says to her when she comes to the well, she's ready to ignore him because, like I said, the Samaritans, they had to pass the Jews all the time. But uh, just to give you one couple more little vignettes about the Samaritans and the Jews. One time when Jesus was passing through another town in Samaria, they said to Jesus, where are you going? He said, I'm going down to the feast. They said, if you're going to the feast to worship in Jerusalem, don't even come through our town. You're not going to find any bed and, and breakfast here. And they said, because they said, you're supposed to worship on Mount Gerizim. And James and John said, Lord, give us the power of Elijah. We will call fire down from heaven and burn them all up and kill them. This is what the apostles, Jesus' followers, and there's probably still some apostles today that feel that way about others, but <laughs> this is what the apostles are saying to Jesus. And Jesus said, oh, you don't know what spirit you're of. I did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. They wanted to burn up a whole Samaritan town, and they would have said, oh, just like Elijah, we got Bible for it. <laughs> but those Samaritans, they didn't even want Jesus to come through their town if he was going to go to Jerusalem. So uh, it's they were prepared to just ignore each other. And so when she comes to get her water, she can tell by the way he dressed that he's a Jew. Maybe, you know, some of the Jews, they, they had blue tassels to help them remember the law of God. That's in the, the writings of Moses. And there were differences in the customs. You could look right away and you could tell. It's like, you know, if we have somebody that, that comes here and they're dressed wearing Indian garb or African garb, we'd be able to tell that. Well, they could tell right away he's a Jew or she's a Samaritan. And she planned on ignoring him. But instead, he kind of arrests her, her thinking and he asks her for a favor. He says, give me a drink. Now, when you go from Aramaic or Greek to English, it might sound like an order. Uh, implied in here is a polite request. So he's not saying, give me a drink. He's saying it like you and I would say, please give me a drink. There's kindness in this that doesn't always come through in the translation, some languages. So one of the things you notice right here, Jesus is thirsty. Jesus had a human body. He was 100% divine and 100% human, but you read just in this one story, he says, I'm thirsty, please give me a drink. It says in verse 6, he was weary from his journey. Did Jesus get tired like we get tired? Did he get sore muscles? Yeah. And then it says the disciples had gone away to buy food. He's hungry. Now you think about this. This is amazing to me. I just have a picture in my mind that um, the disciples go. They say, look, Lord, 
we got to go buy food. We don't have enough to get us all the way to Galilee. There's a town here in Sychar. We're going to go get some food. You sit down and rest. We see how tired you are. You were ministering, you were doing all this ministry down there when we were baptizing in uh, Judea, and we've walked. It's a very long, rugged walk, a lot of up and down hill, rocks and stuff. They said, you sit here and you rest. And hopefully there was maybe a little shade, but we don't know that. And so he's sitting there, and they walk away, and he's by himself. Here is the creator of the heavens and the earth, and he can't get a drink. And he looks off in the well, and takes a little rock, he drops it off, and it goes. <whistles> and he can see his reflection ripple down the bottom of this well. But he can't get the water. He's got to depend on somebody else to give him the water. Jesus could have said, I'm God, water, cup. I mean, he could have done that. But he accepted our lot. Do you know, Jesus never, ever performed a miracle for his own benefit. He always used his power because it was going to benefit others. I'm sure when he multiplied the bread to feed the people, there was something left over for him. But he principally used his power to be a blessing to others. And he said, will you please give me a drink? Now, Jesus actually uses some good psychology there. If he had offered her something right then, she would have ignored him. But because he requests a drink of water, if you live in the Middle East back then, that was one of the, uh, the smartest things you could do. So Jesus, you notice something in verse 9? He ignores the racial barriers. That's a good lesson for us. Uh, now that his disciples are gone, he just, he, he shows her the same kind of respect. He knew that they would have been really shocked. They find out when they come back. She's shocked. The woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews, it's like she said, don't you know that Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans? Where have you been? Haven't you heard? This is how we're supposed to treat each other. And Jesus totally ignores that and engages her. You know, it's also, we're going to deal in our uh, next message about some of the lessons we can learn for, about evangelism in the story of Jesus and the woman at the well. The disciples have gone to town to try to spare him exposure to the Samaritans, and here she is. He's talking to a Samaritan woman. Acts chapter 10, verse 34 and 35, Peter opened his mouth, and he said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. This is a very, very important verse. Did you hear what? I want to give it to you again, because I don't know if everyone caught it when I first said it. Acts 10, 34 and 35. People ask me the question periodically, Pastor Doug, what about all these people who lived in Australia, Africa, South America? They never heard about the gospel until missionaries came to them, you know, 2,000 years ago or 500 years ago. Were all of those thousands and millions of people, were they all automatically lost because they could never hear the gospel? There are some churches that teach yes, because it is true. There's only one name given among men whereby we are saved. Nobody is saved by their works. Everyone who is saved is saved by Jesus. Amen? But there are some people in these countries who haven't heard Jesus' name, but they're listening to Jesus' spirit. And that's why Peter said, he opened his mouth, in truth I perceive God shows no partiality, but in every nation whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. There is hope for these people, but so many of these people don't know about God. That's why missionaries need to go. It's the exception, but there are exceptions. Did God have Naaman? Did Elijah stay with that woman of Tyre and Zidon? There were people that God heard their prayers. So we've got to be careful about being exclusive and thinking, I'm fortunate because I'm Christians. I've got a Bible. I know there's not going to be anyone in heaven but us. I think when we get there, we're going to be finding out that there were people in every land who through the Spirit, through angels, they walked in the light that they had. And in spite of the darkness around them, a God is going to show mercy on them. John 4.10, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God. Now, when he says the gift of God, what is the gift of God? It's in the previous chapter. God so loved the world, he gave his Son. So when Jesus said, if you knew, what is eternal life? That they might know you, 
the only God, and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. If you knew the gift of God, friends, do you know the gift of God? Yes. Jesus is the gift. And who, he doesn't say what it is, who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, how do we get eternal life? How do we get the living water? Ask. You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now, is that just a metaphor that was true back then? Or is it still true today that God offers living water? Amen. Have you ever been thirsty? You know, some wonderful passages in the Bible about Jesus offering us that living water. You can read here, and uh, I've got several verses that talk about this. What is the living water? Jesus said, if you ask me, I will give you the living water. What is that water? Here it is, Genesis 1, verse 2. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. It's the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 44, verse 3, For I will pour water on him who is thirsty. What is the promise? He that hungers and thirsts will be filled. And floods on dry gowns, I will pour my spirit. Bingo. There you have it. What is that water? The Holy Spirit. If we ask Jesus, he said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that talking to you, you would ask for him, that living water. Jesus said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give what? the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. Friends, are you thirsty? He says, if we hunger and thirst for righteousness, we will be filled. He will give us that living water. Last words in the Bible, Revelation 21, are some of the last words. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the fountain of the water of life freely. He'll give it freely to him that thirsts. Friends, are you like that woman at the well? You're finding that uh, the things of the world don't satisfy and you're thirsty for something better? You feel like maybe you're alone and sinful and separated from God? And Jesus, he goes out of his way to come to your city of Sychar to meet you because he wants to save you. He wants to give you that living water. He wants a one-on-one -on -one relationship with you. He says, if you knew the gift of God, you would ask him, and he would give you freely that living water. How many of you would like to say, Lord, I'm thirsty. Please give me that living water. The Holy Spirit, wash away my sins and help me to have that relationship with you. Is that your prayer? part two in uh, the series that we're doing on the woman at the well. And I think this is the last part. We'll see how the Holy Spirit leads. I don't want to always blame the Holy Spirit if I go long. A lot of pastors do that, you know. Once again, Samaria had a long history with Israel, very ingrained hostility between the two. So as they're going through this country, Jesus stays outside of town. They had these wells outside of town where Jacob had dug the well. It's December. We figured that last time we studied because Jesus said, is it not yet four months till the harvest? So it, it may be cool, but it's a sunny day. It's the middle of the day. So he, Jesus is alone. And then he has this meeting with a woman who comes alone. So he sits down by Jacob's well. And by the way, the well is still there today. If you want to run over to Israel, you can see it in Samaria. And there are still Samaritans that live there today. Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, uh, it's you know, quite a walk to go from Judea up to Galilee. We're so used to And Jesus did not ride in a carriage. He did not ride on a horse. He took the poorest means of communication. He sat thus by the well. We remember from our study that Jesus is very human. 
He's hungry. They're going to get him food. He's tired. He's sitting to rest, and he's thirsty. We'll find out in a moment. And it's about the sixth hour. And a woman of Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria says to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, she could look and tell partly maybe from his accent, partly from his attire. Uh, the Jews wore sometimes tassels on their clothing. And uh, it was different from the Samaritans. They dressed a little more like gypsies. And it was pretty clear. And she said, you're a Jew. You're not supposed to talk to me, not only because I'm a Samaritan, but I'm a woman. And so she's kind of shocked by this. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Haven't you heard? <laughs> and Jesus answered and said to her, Boy, if you only knew. If you knew the gift of God. I mean, here she is next to the creator of the universe. Isn't that right? All things that were made were made by Christ. She is right there talking to the creator of the universe, and she's saying, you shouldn't be talking to me. And he's thinking, boy, if you only knew the privilege that I'm talking to you, who it is. And the gift of God. God so loved the world, he gave his son. She's talking to the gift of God. He's saying, if you only knew this, you would have asked him, here I am, ask me. What does God say to us? Ask and you'll receive. You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. You've come here for water, but you're going to get old eventually and die. I've got water that you drink it. It'll satisfy you in this life, and it will be providing eternal life, which is in the later passage. Well, she's mystified by this statement. She's mystified he's even talking to her. And she says, sir, you, how are you going to get me living water? You, you don't have anything to draw with. you got no bucket or pitcher. And the well is deep. You can't reach it by hand. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? She's looking at him and thinking that this man has got a, a holy demeanor about him. She thinks, is this someone even greater than our patriarch Jacob who gave us this well? who drank from it himself. And of course, Jacob's dead, isn't he? So that water, as great as Jacob was, didn't give you eternal life. He drank from it as well as his sons and his livestock. And Jesus answered and said to her, now don't mention, miss the point, livestock, cattle, sheep, goats. Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a fountain. It's artesian, a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The Lord wants to give you artesian life that comes in you. It's like, you know, with Jesus, the bread multiplies. With Jesus, you can fill all the jars and it keeps on coming. The more of Jesus you give away, the more you have to give. And the Holy Spirit does that in our hearts. He says, I am ready to give you this living water. And so with that, I want to now that we caught up, by the way, with verse 14. Uh, we caught up with where we are last week. And so let's pick it up there. And there's still plenty to learn in this story. Want to review? Uh, who is this woman? That says she's a woman of Samaria. She comes alone. Uh, she evidently is uh, something of a social outcast. She does confess to Jesus, as you know, that she's had five husbands, and she's living with a, another guy. That's a total of six so far. And uh, the reason that the other women in the town don't like her very much is because the men in the town liked her a little too much. <laughs> so she comes to the well alone. That's not normal. Uh, we read in the Bible where when Rachel went out, and Eliezer was looking for a wife. I'm sorry, Rebecca. And it says, when the daughters of the land come out to draw water. They used to come together. It was a social event. She's alone. She's not coming in the cool of the day or in the twilight of the afternoon. She's coming in the middle of the day. Sounds like she's deliberately trying to avoid company and gossip. She's not rich, or she would have a servant drawing the water. 
And, uh, but she's, she's intelligent, she's a Samaritan, and she's thirsty. So Jesus says, anyone who drinks the water that I offer, if you would ask, if you knew the gift of God, he'd give you this living water. So she says, okay, I don't know where your bucket is, I don't know where your rope is, I don't know where your well is, but sir, give me that water. And this is what you read now in verse 15, the next verse. The woman said, sir, give me this water that I might not thirst, nor come here to draw. Friends, she asks. I wonder how many people got that close to asking and they didn't cross over. When you ask, you give God permission to invade the devil's territory. You've asked. You've opened the door. And he starts saying, I want to give you that living water, but some things have to happen first. Now, I want to review again, what exactly is the living water that she's asking for? Read in John 7, verse 37 to 39. Jesus is speaking. I'll let you find that verse. I hear the rustle of the pages. I love that. John 7, verse 37. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But he spoke concerning the Spirit. What is the living water? It's the Holy Spirit that he wants to give us. So let me give you some other verses. Isaiah 44, verse 3. For I will pour water on him that is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. You know, one of the things about water, it's a great analogy for the Holy Spirit, and that's why baptism, repent, be baptized, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Baptism is in water. There is no life where there is no water. There is no life where there is no water. All life requires water. Uh, if something is 100% dry and dead, even a seed, if a seed is 100% dry, it will not sprout. It manages somehow to encapsulate some water that keeps it alive, sometimes for millennia, but it needs that little bit of humidity or it will not germinate. It's just a, a miracle. No water, no life. Revelation 22, 17, last chapter, last book of the Bible. And the Spirit, the what? The Spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come. Let him who thirsts come, and let him take the water of life. God is offering us the Holy Spirit. Everybody who's saved will have the Holy Spirit. You know, it's interesting that in John chapter 3, who is the character in John chapter 3? Nicodemus, you know, you must be born again. And he talks about being born of the Spirit. And then you go to John chapter 4, he talks about the water. So you've got both happening here between John chapter 3 and John chapter 4. And Jesus said, unless you are born of the water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So that water is the Holy Spirit. Now before he can fill her with the Holy Spirit, he must cleanse her vessel. And before he can cleanse her vessel, there must be conviction. So Jesus suddenly changes course. He needed her to experience conviction so he could cleanse her and comfort her and commission her and fill her with the living water. In John chapter 4, verse 16, he said, go call your husband and come here. Oh, oh my. Jesus, you know, sometimes when you do target practice, you've seen what a target looks like. You got the circles, you got the bullseye in the middle, you got rings, various number of rings, and your object is to get close to the bullseye as you can, right? The middle. Jesus hit the bullseye. He pointed right at the lowest point. He said, go call your husband. Uh, she said, uh, <clears throat> I, I think she's probably looking around a little bit and going, uh, <laughs> how did we end up here? She felt a terrible arrow of conviction sting her heart because there was this sin in her life. 
And there was part of it that the community knew about, and there was a whole lot of it nobody knew about, except Jesus. And she could tell from the look on his face that he read her entire life. Go call your husband and bring him here. And the woman said, I, I have no husband. Ah, Jesus said, you've said, well, I have no husband. For in fact, you've had five husbands, and the one that you now have is not your husband, which means you're living in adultery. So you, you spoke truly. <laughs> He's positive on the end. He says, well, you're, you're honest. She says, well, this would be a good time to talk about religious issues. I think she's trying to shift the subject a little bit. And she, she starts to talk about where they ought to worship. And Jesus indulges her. And so now she talks about true worship. John 4, verse 19, the woman says, sir, <laughs> I perceive you're a prophet. Our Father, since I've got a prophet here and uh, I've got your undivided attention, I'd like to ask a question that's a big dispute between the Jews and the Samaritans. The big issue was where should they worship? Because the Jews said that God had directed David to build the temple on Mount Zion, which he did. And the Samaritans said, no, God directed us to build the temple on Mount Gerizim, and that's where they worshiped. And uh, the word worship means worth-ship. Going back to the early English, it means you're acknowledging the value, the worth of someone. It means to honor, to reverence as a divine being or a supernatural power, or to regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion, following up with to perform or to take part in worship or the act of worship. It means to revere, to adore, to love. So she's saying, now where should we worship? Should we worship Jerusalem or Samaria? And Jesus goes on and he makes this startling statement many people miss. You'll only find this one place in the Bible. John 4, 21. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me. Now you can understand um, that might be a verse you'd want to underline. What does a woman represent in Bible analogy? So if we were to point to the woman today, it's... We're the bride of Christ, right? And Jesus says, woman, believe me. There's the gospel. Woman, believe me. The hour is coming. Notice that he says it twice. The hour is coming when you will neither worship on this mountain, he nods to Mount Gerizim, which is right there. They're right at the foot of Mount Gerizim. Nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you don't know. <laughs> Jesus is telling a Samaritan, says, you guys don't know what you're worshiping. They only believed in the five books of Moses, and there was a lot of confusion among the Samaritans, and they commingled it with idolatry. You worship what you don't know. We know what we worship, we meaning the Jews. Listen, for Jesus said, for salvation is of the Jews. Now that settles it. When Jesus said salvation is of the Jews, there are hundreds of different religions in the world. There's only four or five major religions. You've got Christianity, you've got Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, and then, you know, you got Sikhism and thousands of other different religions, but Jesus said salvation is of the Jews. The Bible was produced by the Jewish nation. Uh, the prophets were all Jewish. There is a little segment, Nebuchadnezzar wrote his testimony in there when he turned to God, but the rest of the Bible is written by Jews. That doesn't mean all Jews are saved. Then after he talks about true worship, he was getting ready to tear down all these pagan systems with the, the cross. Now he makes a great revelation. John 4, 25 and verse 26, the woman said, I know that Messiah is coming. <laughs> you know why I like this story? This woman's an Adventist. <laughs> For any visitors here today or those who are watching, that was a little tongue-in-cheek statement. Of course, we are Seventh-day Adventists. The reason we have Adventists in our name is because we believe in the coming of the Lord. It means those who believe in the coming of the Lord. Any church that believes in the coming of the Lord, especially if you believe in the imminent coming of the Lord, you're an Adventist. And this woman is looking at Jesus and she's talking about his coming, the coming of the Messiah. So that's great. I know that Messiah is coming. Wow. <laughs> she was 
the rightest person there could be. Is that good English? She's looking at Jesus, saying, I know Messiah is coming. Yeah, there he is, right in front of her. That's about every other preacher has had the time wrong, but <laughs> she had it right. I know Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ when he comes. Look at this emphasis on the return of Christ. Now, she's thinking of the first coming. You and I need to be telling the world about the second coming. He will tell us all things. And then Jesus says to her what he had not said to any scribe or Pharisee or priest. He did not even say it plainly at first to the apostles. He says to her, I who speak to you am he. When he has said that right about this time, the other apostles can be seen coming back from town, and they're looking, and they say, oh, yeah, there's Jesus. He's still there, but who's he talking to? She sees them coming, and she is so excited. Now, I think there's more to the conversation. You know, sometimes the Bible tells you the, the, um, the main points. You can't write down the whole conversation. Because later when she goes into town, matter of fact, I ought to just read it to you here. After this great revelation, it says she walks away from her water pot. Now, why'd she come to the well? She's thirsty. She wanted water. Now Jesus has given her living water. Christ ends up telling the disciples, I've got bread you don't know about. When they offer him something to eat, he says, I've got bread you don't know about. I am so satisfied right now because I just reached a lost person. And that lost person is going to go reach more lost people. And that is so thrilling to me. She is so thrilled now to have found Jesus. She has forgotten her whole mission about getting water. She leaves her water pot. Maybe she leaves her water pot thinking, I haven't given you a drink yet. Here, you can take, you can take my rope in my pot. I'm going to go tell everybody in town. She cannot wait to go tell other people. Now, this woman was not a pastor. But when she found Jesus, she becomes an evangelist. I, I don't find Bible support for women pastors, but I do find support for women evangelists. Mary Magdalene, she was the first one to tell about Jesus rising from the dead. And so she, she goes and she tells everybody in the city, come and see the man. And as a result of that, they all begin to come out. Now, you know, in this, it says here, you can read when uh, Jesus, the disciples said, aren't you hungry? Don't you want to eat? Jesus says in, in John 4, 35, same chapter, do you not say there were four months until the harvest? Behold, I say, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. Jesus was so excited because here, this whole community, look at John 4, 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that ever I did. Now, <laughs> that probably also made some of the men in the town a little nervous. In John verse, uh, 4, 40, verse 42, then they said to the woman, they came, they listened, they find out for themselves, they heard Jesus preach, they said, will you please stay in our town? Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that indeed he is the Christ, the Savior of the world. Isn't that wonderful? Through the testimony of this woman, she goes into town, this woman that, uh, isn't it interesting, Jesus uses Mary Magdalene, who had a questionable reputation, and he uses this Samaritan woman who had a questionable reputation, and he uses the church. Oh, he'll use us? Some of you are dry. You don't have the living water. The starting point is, Jesus is saying, ask. He is as anxious to give you that living water today. It doesn't matter how many husbands you've had, or how, what your sins are, how many wives you've had. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. Jesus said that he came into the world to save sinners. If you're a sinner, you qualify. He came to seek and to save the lost. If you're lost, you qualify. He says, you ask, you come to him. Helpless, she came to him alone, and we all come personally to Jesus. And we ask and say, Lord, give me that living water. He wants to give you that living water. 
And he'll do that today. And you can ask him for that right now. Then he wants you to share the living water. And we've got a couple of issues. We've got a lot of people who are thankful for the living water, but we're not sharing it. Do you realize if you do not share it, it gets stagnant in your own heart? It needs to flow out to stay fresh. I remember hearing a remarkable story during the Civil War in 1862, I think it was. Um, it was the Battle of Fredericksburg. And there was a uh, sergeant, young man, 19 years old, but he was a sergeant, Richard Kirkland. And um, in this terrible battle, I mean, the, the, the general on the field there at Fredericksburg, the, the Union general, he gave some terrible orders. I mean, it's hard to imagine how they fought back then, but here the Confederate soldiers had the heights. It was called Mary's Heights on this hill. And there were thousands of them up there behind a stone wall. And you, if you got the high ground, you got the advantage. And the Union general, you know the Union soldiers lost almost all of their battles until they finally got General Grant on board. They were losing one battle after another to the Confederates to the south. And the general sent all his men, he said, take the hill. And so they all went charging up the hill, and one after the other, the Confederate soldiers would just, they would reload and fire down, and they were just piling up the soldiers. Thousands and thousands died in this battle on this big field between the two armies. The sun went down, and um, those among the wounded who were mobile would stagger off the field. They called them the walking wounded or they would crawl off the field back to their lines. But so many of them were wounded and they couldn't get away. And it was December. It's cold, but they're still very thirsty. Do you know that more soldiers died in the Civil War than any other battle in American history? More of those soldiers died from disease than from bullets. They say that if penicillin had been discovered about 50 years sooner, it would have cut a lot of the deaths in the Civil War. Of those who died from disease, most of it was from bad water. They didn't know how to carry large amounts of water for an army back then. And uh, they didn't have tanker trucks. All they had was these little canteens. They had to hope that they would hike by a clean stream. And the problem was all these armies were moving, and they were often drinking out of puddles that all of the horses had just marched through. And so dysentery just swept through the ranks of the North and South, and they just they struggled. And so on the battlefield that night, they just heard all these soldiers calling out, water, 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 help. And thousands of them. Kirkland couldn't stand it anymore, and he went to the uh, Brigadier General Kershaw, and he said, you got to let me go out there and give some water to the men. And he said, well, those are Union soldiers, most of them. They got shot in front of our stone wall, their unions. He says, I know, but they're closer to us than their own troops. Their own troops aren't going to come because they're afraid we're going to shoot. These men are in absolute agony. He said, let me bring them some water. He says, you're going to get shot right away. He said, I'm willing to risk dying. He says, I can't stand to hear them cry anymore. He said, okay. Kirkland said, can we hoist a white flag while I do it? He said, absolutely not. They'll think we're surrendering. He said, can I wear a white handkerchief? He said, no. He said, it'll be misunderstood. So he went and he collected canteens from the other Confederate soldiers that felt sorry for their uh, troops. You realize in the Civil War, sometimes brothers fought on opposite sides. And it might be your own brother on the other side of the wall crying because he shot. So he went and they had a clean creek nearby the Confederate soldiers. He went and filled all these canteens with a clean creek. And in broad daylight, he hiked over the wall by himself. And sure enough, a few of the Union soldiers began to fire at him. But it was far enough away where they missed. And then they realized what he was doing. He was one by one going to the wounded soldiers and giving them water, propping them up. It was very cold. Matter of fact, during this battle, they said some of the soldiers, they couldn't get away in the morning because the blood from their wounds had frozen them to the ground. So some of them were dying of uh, cold, and, and it was just a terrible, terrible situation. But he, one by one, he went, and he's giving them water and uh, covering them. 
and try and take care of them. And pretty soon cheers went up from the Union soldiers, cheers went up from the Confederates, and they called him the Angel of Mary's Heights because he cared about giving water to those that were thirsty. Well, he did it for an hour and a half out there in the, what you call no man's land, supplying that living water, trying to keep those men alive and keep them warm. Then when he had taken care of every man that was alive that he could reach, he went back and resumed his post as a Confederate soldier, died in battle. He went to most of the major battles. He died in battle a year later. They got several statues that they've made of Kirkland and paintings uh, because of his sacrifice, willing to die to bring somebody else water. And this is what Jesus did. He came into the world and he died to give us living water. And he's offering it freely. The Bible ends by saying, whoever thirsts, let him come and take the water of life freely. How many of you want to say, Lord, I want to drink. I want that living water. How many of you are willing to say, Lord, and I want to share that living water with others? I want it to not just go in me. I want it to go through me.